We've been looking at Romans a long time ago, and we got started in the first part of the chapter and the gospel of God. Romans was a declaration of God's working. It's doctrinal, and its primary focus is the gospel. But before we get into the gospel... There's an introduction in chapter 1, and then we get into some tough stuff, and we're going to be right in the middle of that tough stuff today. So if you want to leave now, it's okay, but it's in the book, and so we're going to look at it. We're going to talk about it. The gospel is God's good news defined. Thought I had the wrong section here. <clears throat> Some themes that we found was the gospel reaches out to humanity, it's powerful, it changes lives, and righteous people live by faith. But it, Romans talks about the very sad and broken condition of humanity. I don't know about you, but every time I read the news or listen to the news, I think of the brokenness of humanity. We're broke. We're lost, apart from the redemption that we have through Jesus. And we can have peace with God, and that choice is given to us. Verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul spent his life preaching the gospel, and he said, I'm not ashamed of it, because it's the power of God. And apart from this message, we have nothing. We really have nothing. But you know, before I'll slow down for a curve on the highway, I need to see a sign. And so you have these warning signs. If you're coming from Hope to, towards uh, Chilliwack, there's one particular place where the lights are flashing and there's a tight curve around to the left, and you're supposed to slow down. Well, those lights are there for a reason. They're warning that if you don't slow down, there's consequences. My father told me as a child, don't touch that hot stove. And I reached out to touch it and I got slapped. I got the consequences without the burn. There's consequences to disobedience. And that's what we're going to find in in Romans. The wrath of God is revealed. There's two revelations here in chapter 1. First of all, the gospel is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And then secondly, in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. So let's take a look at this. The revelation of the righteousness of God. When I look at humanity, and I look at the best of humans, when I look at the best of leaders... They're failures at the best. Am I right? And when we look at church leaders, church leaders are failing people too. We're all redeemed by the blood of Christ. And that's all we are. Apart from the gospel, we have nothing. The righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So he says the just shall live by faith. How are you living? Are you living by doing? I've met several people recently, and they're planning on getting to eternity through their doings. And it's not going to get them there. It's like being in a car, a gasoline-driven car, and no gas in the tank. It can look pretty. You can polish it up all you like, but it won't get you anywhere. The just shall live by faith. Abraham is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. 
And his faith was recognized before he did anything. He obeyed the voice of God. The revelation of the wrath of God. Let's read this together, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. People have painted God as an angry God. It makes me mad when I hear it. How come God is so cruel that he allowed that to happen? Why does God bring this upon humanity? The people of Sodom and Gomorrah could have raised their ugly heads and said, Why, God, are you doing this to me? God is not an angry God. Sometimes we meet people, and they're angry. They can't say a pleasant word. Have you ever met one of those? Everything they say, there's negativity and anger coming out. And anger is poured right through their being. It's like their blood is running angry. Don't paint God like that. He's not like that. But the wrath of God is an attribute. It's a characteristic of him. It's being revealed against notice, against the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Wow, is that ever the case today? Push the truth down. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. There is indeed a time of wrath coming. <clears throat> Why the anger? Psalm 78. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 78. <clears throat> and the writer here is dealing with Israel's failure. O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation and praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell all their children. They would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. I believe this is a dilemma that we have in our society. Parents have not been teaching their children. I read a man speaking about the problems of the U.S., and he said the problem of the U.S. is not anything more than a problem with the fathers. It's interesting. God said, teach your children. Let them know. Verse 12, he did miracles in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the region of Zon. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with a cloud by day and with light from fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag. He made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. 
But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for his people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel, for they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. He let loose the east wind from the heavens and let forth the south wind by his power. He rained meat down on them like dust, flying birds like sand on the seashore. He made them come down inside their camp all around their tents. They ate till they had more than enough, for he had given them what they craved. But before they turned from the food they craved, even while it was still in their mouths, God's anger rose up against them. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. In spite of this all, they kept on sinning. Wow. Was there anything God didn't give them? He gave them everything. And they still weren't happy. And because they did not believe his wonderful works, his anger broke out against them. When we come to Romans, we have a similar situation. God has shared with humanity his very being. Romans chapter 1 again. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm about to run out of the platform here in water. Better bring a dam or something. <clears throat> So Paul writes, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Notice verse 19. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And so we see this amazingness that God reveals himself to humankind. We have a neighbor, a neighbor of the church, who called up and said, your backyard light is bothering us so we can't sit on our porch and view the stars. So I turned the light off. At least after 9.30 I turned it off. They wanted to look at the stars. When we were up in the shoe shop, my, my wife's brother and his wife were with us, and they were sitting out on the patio, and they said, let's see who can see the first star. And so everybody's eyes are in the sky looking for the first star. If you go over to Ross's house, or Jack's house, they got these telescopes to look up at the stars, and they can tell you all kinds of stuff. Beautiful. But Paul says the glory, or the heavens declare the glory of God. Pardon me, that's the psalmist, right? But here he says, from the very beginning of time, he's revealed his very nature, his power, his eternal power. You know what the stars remind me of? The perfection and plan of God. How these things hang up there on nothing. I've never been able to hang anything on nothing. I've got to have a string, a rope, or a chain, or something. But God hangs everything on nothing. Not only is it hanging on nothing, it's rotating and in an orbit about something that is absolutely prescribable. So that we can take a rocket and send it up into the sky and six months later it can land where it's supposed to land. That's not our ingenuity. That's God's masterpiece. And all they're doing is locking into the math that is already in place. And just because a Russian cosmonaut says, I didn't see God out there, means nothing. These things declare the glory of God. Forget about the sky for a minute. And come down to the doctors looking in electron microscopes and see that 
what they're seeing circling around the nucleus in the cell, the electrons running around are exactly in the orbit that they're designed to be. The magnetism and all of that working in our cells. Consider my eyeball. It's better than the best camera ever made. Created by my creator. The very creation speaks about his power and eternal power and his divine nature. Through creation, God allowed man to understand him in whatever measure we were able to. I'm going to stick my neck out a little bit here. When you come to a people that have only creation to look at, they've never heard the gospel story, will we be in eternity with them? I wonder. The reason I wonder is this. I read my Bible about a man named Melchizedek. He wasn't in God's order. He wasn't a descendant from Abraham. He was out of nowhere. God had chosen him. Creation allows us to understand God in some little measure. But let's forget about those people for now and let's talk about us. Because once we know something, we're held accountable for what we know. When my daddy said, don't touch that stove because it's hot, he imparted knowledge to me, and it was up to me to honor that knowledge, correct? So when he saw my hand reaching out to touch that red hot piece of metal, he slapped it down out of the way. Was he cruel or was he kind? The problem is that with all of this knowledge, verse 21, for although they knew God, neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. <clears throat> when we don't give God his place, our thinking becomes empty. <coughs> Sometimes I listen to people's reasoning on that. Where did that come from? Where is that? It doesn't even make sense. But it's the right reasoning in their mind. It's emptiness. Because it comes from dark hearts. And human wisdom becomes foolishness. Pardon me. But is there anything so foolish as taking the police off the job in a vile society? That is dark thinking. That's foolishness. But you have this great exchange going on. You have the glory of God changed for images of created things. And so remember in the Acts there was a huge uproar because this silversmith was making idols for, for Diana. And he was making a lot of money off these idols. That's what he's talking about here. People have changed the glory of God into idolatry, into making stuff that you can look at and worship. <coughs> and as a result, God gave them over to their lust and dishonor, degrading their bodies with one another. I want you to notice three stages in Romans chapter 1. Three stages of depravity. It goes from bad to worse to absolute worse. And we have that listed in our chapter. First of all, then, they don't give God his due. <clears throat> now, how often do we set a set of rules, and those rules are broken, and they're broken, and they're broken, and finally we say, oh, well, go ahead. Bear the consequences of your rules. God says he gives them up. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. In other words, God said, okay, I'm removing 
the barrier. Go for it. You want to do it? Do it. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is praised forever. We don't worship things, right? Uh Uh-huh. How many of you love sports? But I know you don't worship it. But there are people who take athletes and put them on a pedestal. Are they the source of their prowess? Or is it their creator? So we worship the created in place of the creator. The entertainers with the absolute beautiful voices <coughs> and the ability to do all kinds of funny things with their bodies. We say, wow, look at how gifted that person is. That's it. It's been given them from their creator. And we see somebody like Elon Musk having accumulated this massive wealth and this massive empire. And so people say, wow, he really must be something. Yeah, right. God gave him the brain. God gave him the opportunity. Remember that every gifted person has received a gift from God. Isn't it refreshing when you see a gifted person who gives credit to their God? Who do we worship? The result of people worshiping the created things more than the creator is again, God gives them over to shameful lusts. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. So here you have prostitution. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Homosexuality. Men committed indecent acts with other men, receiving in themselves a due penalty for their perversion. Got a problem with monkeypox. Everybody knows we've got a problem with monkeypox. No, we don't. It's a particular group of people have a problem with monkeypox. What does Paul say? The awful results, the penalty due to, of their error. Furthermore, they go, they go down even further. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have been filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, And malice, they're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. What a list. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve those who practice them. And we have this craziness that we begin to make normal the absolute negativity of society. And so we find prisoners being released from prison, not paying for their crimes, released on early bail. Why? Because this is the right thing to do. Notice this list. They become filled with every kind of wickedness. Evil. Greed. <clears throat> Had to do a, <clears throat> a course, a crazy little course on the computer this week. How to recognize fishing. Not this kind of fishing. The kind of phishing that comes through your computer screen, through your phone screen. And I had to answer five questions, and I had to get 80% right, or I failed. It's like grade one. Come on. 
But people are trying to take your money and your security. I read a story, beautiful story in the end. This girl, she comes from Asia. She answers an ad in the States. She's coming over for a job. She's met at the airport. She's commandeered. She's taken to a brothel. And she finds herself in prostitution. Wasn't what she signed up for. She came for a job. But she broke out, got to the authorities, and they closed it down. Praise God. And now she runs an organization rescuing the trafficked. I love that. They think evil. Truckloads of people coming across from Mexico in the back of trucks. This isn't their fault. This is the evil nature of the cartels doing this. Greed and depravity, they're filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Those base natures are filling them. It's no wonder that the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness. Because it can't keep getting worse. Although they know God's righteousness, his righteous decree, yet they approve of those who practice these evil deeds. Our, our society has indeed graduated to this condition. <clears throat> We're accepted based on our approval of these perversion of values. I got a course that's sitting waiting for me. I have 90 days to complete it. This is all due to the fact that our company has been bought by somebody else. I've got 90 days to complete it. And it's all about how to treat people. And it's all about not stepping over the line. And I've drawn a line in my brain. This is my line in the sand. Not going here. It's called sensitivity training. I'll tell you a story of a young lady. She had the top marks in her class. She graduated from college, applied to a university. Got turned down. Highest mark. Went for an interview. Oh, your experience has all been faith-based experience. This young lady wants to be a teacher. She has a way more volunteer hours at Delta Christian School than is necessary. But the answer to the supervisor accepting her into Simon Fraser University is your experience is far too faith-based. Something wrong with this picture. Really wrong with this picture. Our society has graduated to this condition. Anything is okay as long as it's not God. All the more reason to let our beacon shine. All the more reason that we should be shining examples of our Lord Jesus. Because along with the bad news, there is the good news. The gospel has been revealed to us. Jesus became sin for us. Later on in some of Paul's epistles, he says, Such were some of you, but you were washed. You've been cleansed. You're a new creature. Praise God. Jesus became sin for us. Doesn't that make his sacrifice on the cross all the more heinous. When you think about it, the sins of the world were laid on him in those three dark hours. This is a takeaway from our last session. 
God is actively reaching out to humanity even though they're broken. There is salvation for everyone. I was telling the girls in our office yesterday, pardon me, on Friday, I said, let me tell you about my friend. They call her Mama Wendy. I said, Mama Wendy went to Bolivia as a missionary's wife. And somehow or other, she got involved in the prison ministry. And Mama Wendy today, she ministers to a man who's in the inner, sanctions, in, inner core of the prison. He's got 35 murders to his credit, and he's become a Christian because of Mama Wendy. But gospel is powerful to change. Powerful to change even a murderer of 35 victims. Powerful to change even a religious sinner. Powerful to change us from wherever we've been. May we seek to be a beacon of light in this dark world. In chapter 2, Paul is going to deal with us as religious people. He said, though you say one thing and practice another, does that mean God isn't going to hold you accountable? You and I are accountable for what we say. We're accountable for how we live. We're accountable to be our light in the midst of our dark world. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that no knowing the darkness and depravity of our vile world, you are still offering a gift of love. You still offer Salvation to those who will believe. But to those who refuse, to those who turn a blind eye, to those who reject, there is this wrath of God revealed. Thank you, Father. We come to you as your people today, and we thank you that we'll never face the wrath because Jesus has faced it for us. There on the cross, he bore my sin in his own body on the tree. We thank you that we've been given the privilege of living for you. We've been given the privilege of sharing the good news of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. Help us to continue to do that. May we minister to everybody we come in contact with. There's lots of hurting people out there. And Father, even those who have turned their eyes away from you May we share with them as well. For your grace is open as long as the day of grace is running its course. We commit our way to you, Father, giving you thanks for this beautiful day. We think of those who are hurting, for those who are struggling with health, and we lift them up before you. You know them, everyone. We think of Christians who are struggling because because their churches are struggling. We pray for them. We pray for each one of us that we may, we may seek to work and edify and build each and every one in our congregation. We bless you for this opportunity in Jesus' precious name. Amen.